Hey everybody, welcome to my photography masterclass. Today we're going to be in studio taking a look at how you can better understand your camera settings. So as we usually do, we do a couple of housekeeping rules first. For those of you who are new, let me just check one thing to make sure we're up and running here. For those of you who are new, this is welcome to Masterclass Friday. This is something we do every Friday as the name implies. Um, and we basically do this so that you can get a better understanding of Adobe tools. So we have master classes throughout the day from various evangelists on graphic design, Photoshop, um, you, uh, um, uh, audio video, drawing and painting, and of course, Adobe Express. So thanks for joining us live here. And if you are watching this on YouTube and Facebook and and Twitter and LinkedIn, that's cool. But if you really want to participate in the main chat that I'll be mainly paying attention to, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live. So Sheila Ferguson, for example, is over on YouTube. Good morning, Sheila. And uh, so is uh, Jesse. You guys can hang out wherever you are. But again, the main chat that I'll be paying attention to for questions is the b.net slash Adobe Live. I will try to see your questions in the other chat. So I see Rosa saying hello. But I'm also looking at Thomas, Ozzy, Marsha, Sean. Um, those are the ones that in the other chat. So I'll try and look at both windows. There's no guarantee I'll look at the other window, but I'll try. All right, so with that said, um, let's get into a little bit about what we're gonna be doing today. I'm in studio, I'm not working with a live model that way we, can, we don't have to bore someone to death talking about camera settings, but I have a, a mannequin over here that we're gonna be using to do our portrait sessions. Uh, but we're gonna get into camera settings from the very beginning, as far as I can go within an hour. Now, cameras, especially the latest mirrorless and DSLR cameras, have literally hundreds of settings. We're not gonna cover hundreds of settings today. There's no, just not enough time. But we will cover what I consider the most important and the ones that will lay the foundation so that no matter what camera you pick up, whether it's a DSLR, mirrorless, or even your smartphone, you'll have a better understanding of how to set that camera to do what you want it to do. And then from there, if you wanna dive into the deeper uh, settings like rear camera shutter or, or curtain uh, to control your light better and all that, you can dive into those settings because you'll have the foundation. All right, so with that said, uh, good morning and you're welcome for this. And let me just check one more thing. I just want to make sure um, that I was doing an update. Well, famous last words, my computer was doing an update. I wasn't doing an update. But I just want to check and make sure that when I get ready to show you the phone portion, that it will let me show you my phone. That wasn't working a minute ago. I'm on a slightly different setup than I normally use. But that's not your fault. <laughs> that's my fault. And let's see if it sees my phone now. Yay, it sees my phone now. All right, so this is going to be a better day. All right, so with that said, let me pop over to my computer so you guys can see what I've got going on here. And also let me turn on the camera so you can see what's going on there as well. I had the camera off to preserve battery. So um, you'll always see, you know, you'll be able to see my desktop like you normally do. And uh, you'll see, you know, things I'm showing you on the computer. But also you'll see camera settings. You'll, we'll get into all of what's going on on the camera. So as I'm doing things, um, my, my newest mirrorless camera does a nice job of showing you everything that's on. And as I turn things on and off, you'll be able to see them change on the camera itself. And then there's a studio shot, so you can kind of see the setup there. And again, we have some still life. <laughs> this is what I call it. Her, her name's Dot, by the way, because she's wearing a polka dot dress. But anyway, Dot is there, and I also have a chess set. We're going to do a little macro photography to show you some differences there. I've got kind of a background that looks like a, someone's living room or home. It was basically meant for, live, or for doing Zoom calls. Uh, so we'll see how we can take that background out of focus and uh, give it that shallow depth of field. All right, so that's what we're going to be doing in studio. I should be looking up at that camera. That's what we're going to be doing in studio. Uh, but anyway, let's go back to the desktop because that's where we're going to start. 
And I'm going to just basically start with a couple of images here. Now, this is a, this is a uh, dial on, a, um, on an, an icon. This is an icon dial. And right next to it is a Canon dial. They are pretty much the same. They will vary depending on the model, depending on, you know, like consumer models will have more of the things on the right-hand side, like scenes, like portrait and, and close-up and, and speed and like that. And, oh, actually, yeah. And, um, and the more professional ones will have things like U1, U2, U3, because those are user-defined settings. But it doesn't matter what your camera has as far as those optional things are concerned, you can go on your manual and look those up. What we're mainly gonna be concentrating on today are the five at the bottom. Auto, and I know they're upside down, but auto, manual, A, S, and P for aperture priority, shutter priority, and program mode. So those are the five we're gonna concentrate on today. Anything outside of those five that your camera has, feel free to go discover what those are on your own time. But the main ones that your camera will most likely have are variations of these five. So even on the Canon side, for example, the letters are a little bit different. So it's M, but instead of A, it's AV. Instead of S, it's TV. And instead of, oh no, and actually it is P and it is auto. So uh, the a, AV and TV are the same thing as the um, A and S on an icon. So aperture priority, shutter priority. Okay, so now that your, <laughs> your camera doesn't have auto, every camera has auto because it's a great place to start. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Photographers for years have been doing photography, learning things the hard way. Because for years, cameras couldn't be trusted to do things for you. So you were always having to do things manually. Like you get a brand new camera, turn off all that auto stuff and switch it to manual so you can be in complete control. And there are definitely situations where I'm in manual. I'm in manual most of the time in the studio. But when I leave this studio and I'm out and about, I'm almost never on manual because the camera, A, can do a good enough job on other, those other modes I talked about, and B, if I'm out and about in uncontrolled situations, it's usually too hard. And I, sh I shouldn't say too hard. It's usually harder to try and do it in manual than letting the camera do some of the lifting. So when you bought a camera, especially in the last 10 years, whether it's your new smartphone or your new regular camera, you bought it because it had all these features. It, it's got a better sensor. It's got better noise reduction. It's got better um, noise performance. It's got better... Um, faster autofocus, it's got faster this, better that. But then you're like, oh no, turn off all that, switch it all to manual because I want to be in control. Then why, then go get an old camera. What'd you buy a new one for? <laughs> the new one has better controls, so why not take advantage of them? Now, for the diehards out there that say, no, 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 Terry, I'm gonna always do it all myself, rock on. You probably don't need this class because you already know all the stuff you want to do. So have a great day. You can hang out and listen, but you already know all this stuff. So anyway, if you're not that person and you're saying, Terry, I want to learn and I want to finally uh, get better with my settings of my camera and understanding what they're for, that's what this is for. So there's no right or wrong. It's really what you're comfortable with. And a little, another secret, Everyone started out on auto because it was the easiest. Then we progressed into the other modes. So let's explain what they are. Let's get into some examples. And let's go into, um, I'm going to switch. I was in Lightroom. I'm going to switch over to Lightroom Classic because in Lightroom Classic, I've got, um, I've got my camera tethered so I can, I can shoot at the same time. Okay, so let me switch over to the camera. So that's where we're going to be spending our time. And I'm on auto. So I'm pretty much on auto everything. I'm on auto white balance. I'm going to auto ISO. We're going to get into all that. I'm on auto every, just about everything I can be on. And let me switch to one more thing so I can see my notes. 
so I don't forget to cover something. Okay. Before I even deal with auto, there's one more thing, and I just saw it on my note. That's why I'm glad I brought my notes up. There's one more thing we should talk about first, and that's this. Let's go into this setting right here. The quality. Your camera has all these, you know, most of these quality settings. So notice that I'm on RAW. And it's kind of, the reason I want to cover this first is because usually when a person sets this, they rarely ever go change it. So let's go ahead and get this out of the way first. Um, and it's not a weird question. And yes, you can only do tethering in Lightroom Classic Lightroom cloud as you guys call it doesn't have tethering okay so i'm on raw and your camera more than likely shipped on jpeg because again they don't want a lot of tech support calls so they put it on the most common format that works everywhere that people are going to um, not have a problem with why would you change it so and by the way you notice you don't really see one called jpeg you see fine with an asterisk, fine, normal, basic, uh, everything after raw, basically. Those are all JPEG settings. I don't know. I don't know why they don't call it JPEG. Here, let me see if I switch over to one of those. Will it switch to JPEG? Yep. Okay. There it is. It says JPEG now at the top. So um, everything past raw is JPEG. Why would you put it on fine versus normal versus basic? Because each one of those, base, it's basically three quality settings. Basic being the lowest, normal being the middle, fine being the highest quality JPEG you're going to get out of your camera. So, okay, great. Now I know which one of those I would pick, because why would you not want the best one? <laughs> I don't ever understand that. Uh, it may make the file a little bit bigger, but who cares if it's I'm looking for quality shots. Anyway. Fine is, is usually the one I want. Now, um, then why do I put it on raw? Because, and I'm just doing this now so I don't forget. Because when you put it on raw, what you're telling the difference of the camera is, in JPEG, you're letting the camera make some decisions for you. You're letting the camera cook in the white balance, whatever you set it to. You're letting the camera do some a little bit of fine tuning of the image to make it look as good as it can. And usually when you're putting it in JPEG, you're also, you're able to use scene modes like um, landscape, night, uh, portrait, so forth and so on. So again, it cooks the JPEG a little bit better so that you are happier with what you get. That's what JPEG's all about. I take a picture, oh my God, it looks great. I'm happy, problem solved. The downside to JPEG is it's compressed, meaning lossy compression. And that means it's taking away some of the quality. It's making those decisions before you even get a chance to look at it. RAW is, as the name, as the acronym or name implies, it's the raw format of your sensor. So it's basically no, nothing's been done to it. No processing. It's as, it's as close to from the sensor to your computer as you're gonna get. The downside to that is, out of the camera, they don't look good. They don't look great. They, they look kind of dull, kind of flat, because that's the point of RAW, is that nothing was done to it, no decisions were made, you're in control, you make your own decisions. Then you take it into a program like Lightroom or Lightroom Classic, and you turn it into the image you want. You adjust the settings, you adjust the exposure, you adjust um, the vibrance and the saturation and all those things. So if you say, Terry, I don't care about any of that. I just want to go out and shoot, have good looking pictures, share them on social and be done with it. JPEG's your friend because out of the camera, JPEG's going to produce a better looking photo that you don't have to do anything to. For everyone else that says, no, 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 I want to, I'm a photographer. I want to make it look like my look. You're better off starting with the raw. That's the difference. Okay. Now that we got that out of the way, 
Now we can get back to the other, other stuff. Okay, so I put it on raw. I told it okay. I'm not gonna get into the other stuff just yet. And now I'm on auto, I'm on fully auto. So that means the camera is making all the decisions except focus, because autofocus is another thing. The camera's making all the decisions on how this image should look. So I'm gonna go ahead and I just autofocused, we'll get into that in a minute. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, yep, take the picture. Oh, I forgot to put on tethering. Sorry, my bad. Hang on. I'm like, why didn't it come up? Hold on. Let me show you what I got to do first. I forgot to do this. Let's go into tether capture, start tether capture. And we're going to call this, we'll call it dot. <laughs> That's her name. And we'll start it with one. And we'll put in my metadata template, which needs to be updated for 2023. And we'll say, okay. And it should detect the camera. There it is. Do I have a memory card in here? In a minute. Yep, there's a memory card in here. That's why. Should come up instantly when it doesn't have to look at what's on the card. Okay. There's a shot. There's dot in auto. That's what I that's what I got. And that's pretty much what I'm seeing in studio. If I look at the look at the studio. Well, the studio's just got ambient light. It's got a light on above her head, just a regular ceiling light. There's a big flash here, but it's completely not being used right now. It's off. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of what, you know, you, what it saw, and that's what I got. Now, I'm in Lightroom. I can make it brighter. I can, I can select subject. I can get her, uh, you know, I, change her exposure. I can do all of that. But out of the camera, I had no choices it did everything for me, and that's what I got. Okay, so now let's go back, and let's talk about three things. Because these are really the three decisions you'll be making. Number one, do I want to freeze action, or do I want motion blur? I want to freeze action. I don't want her blurry. So I want her to be perfectly in focus and perfectly sharp. Number two, do I want the background to be in focus or not? I'm going to talk about what, how you do that. And number three, do I want it to be warm or cool looking? Those are usually the three choices you're making. You can make other choices creatively outside of that. But those are the three main choices you're going to be making. And auto says... I'm going to decide how your background looks. I'm going to decide whether I should freeze motion or not because it doesn't know what this is. And I'm going to decide whether it's warm or cool because I'm in auto, auto ISO. I'm sorry, auto uh, white balance. So that's what auto does. It just says, I'm making all of the decisions, period. Don't like them? Then switch to another mode where you're in control. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Now, like I said, we all start out in auto, but in most cases, we outgrow it pretty quickly because unless you have no real, like you have no real requirements, <laughs> like you just don't care, you're going to get to a point to where you're going to say, well, I want this to be this way and I want this to be that way. Like you're going to start wanting things. That's what's, that's what's going to take you out of auto eventually. Now, when we use our smartphones, we're in auto all the time. I'm going to show you how to get out of the auto in your smartphone too. But when you're a smartphone, you just pull it out of your pocket, turn it on. You might adjust the zoom and you might tap to focus, but then you're just going to take the picture and it's making all the decisions for you. And you trust your smartphone because you know why? It does a pretty darn good job. You don't have to make a lot of decisions. It does it for you. And usually if you're shooting with your phone, it's in the moment. It's quick. You don't have time to, eh, I want to adjust this. I want to do that. And they even give, gave us um, portrait mode so that the background can be out of focus. Now, again, with portrait mode, you don't have a lot of control. You can adjust the aperture after the fact now on the later iPhones. 
But that's it. It's out of it's shallow depth of field that it decides. You don't have a choice. Okay, so now let's get out of auto. So, so we know what auto does. It's automatic. I don't really get to do much else. I can choose where I focus. That's about it. It's going to take the picture that it sees. Now, as I'm moving this little dial on the back of my camera, you can see, can you see the, the yeah, you can see the little yellow square, and that little yellow square is my camera's automatic um, eye detection. So if I move it off her eye, if I move it off her face, that yellow square goes away because it says in this red rectangle, I do not see an eye. So therefore, I'm just going to focus on this this area that you point it to. But as soon as I move it up and it sees the eye and I click, I know that that eye is in focus. And as a tip, um, I'll tell you what the bright li lights are in a minute. I'll reverb mic. As a tip, it's saying, or I'm, I'm sorry, as a tip, when you're doing photographs of people or animals or whatever, if you have to choose what's going to be in focus, it's almost always the eyes. You almost always will have, you want the eye in focus. The rest will take care of itself. But if the eye is blurry, no one can concentrate on anything else in the picture. So as a just rule, focus on eyes when you're photographing people or animals. Okay, next up, uh, we're going to get out of auto. So I'm going to go to the next mode down, which is actually not the next one in order, P. What's the difference between, um, between auto and program mode? It's P is for program. And there's not a ton of difference. Auto is still, auto is everything, and P is still setting your exposure but it's giving you a couple of controls over a couple more things. And like you can still control like a little. <laughs> and I'm just going to leave it at that. So when I, when I got out of auto mode, when I started shooting, I was, P was my, my friend. It was pro program mode because I didn't have to worry about the exposure, but I could still work with things like aperture. So it let me do things that auto wouldn't, wouldn't gave me no control. Program gave me a little more control and it was taking care of the exposure. So the images were coming out bright enough or dark enough. I don't have to worry about anything else. So that's what program mode is for. So when you graduate out of auto, like when you're tired of auto, try program next. And then you can decide if that's enough control for you or you want to go further. Okay, next, <laughs> someone says, I don't think I've ever used P. So when you saw that bright flash like that, what that is, is my camera is saying, it's a little dark there, so I'm going to brighten it up so I can see what to focus on. That's all that means. So and some cameras will actually have a little LED and it puts a light on the subject long enough to expose the subject for autofocus, then it turns that light off. So that's all that was doing. Okay. And the joke, by the way, for those of you who are new, is that P means professional. That's a joke. It doesn't. But people always say that because they're trying to make fun of the people that shoot in P. Okay. And there's no reason to make fun, by the way. Next up, let's get out of program mode because, again, there's not a whole lot different that I'm going to do there. I can, like, I'm, I'm adjusting my... Um, my shutter, yeah, I can show you this. I'm adjusting the shutter speed a little. Oh, actually, I'm not. I'm moving the focus point around. All right, let's get out of uh, program. Let's move over to, let's go to aperture priority. I would say that aperture priority is probably my favorite next to manual. And it's probably the one that I'm in the most when I step outside the studio. Manual in the studio, out on the street, walking around, travel photography, aperture priority. Why? What does aperture priority do that makes it my favorite choice outside of manual? 
Your aperture, also sometimes referred to as your f-stop, controls that shallow depth of field. So aperture or f-stops are typically in numbers like, um, in my case right now, it's on f32. This lens goes all the way up to f28. And the, the lower the number, the more wide open the lens is. It's weirdly backwards in my mind, but that's the way it always worked. So why, when you hear someone say, hey, you can shoot wide open, that's what they mean. You can shoot at your highest aperture, which is actually the lowest number. Um, so F28 says, I'm going to put as much as I can out of focus in the background behind the subject. F32, all the way up or down, whichever way you want to look at it, is more of the backgrounds in focus. So if I go down to what this lens is capable of, F28, and I'm going to move something that's easy to see in the background so you can really tell. Let's move this light. Put this light in the background with the word Westcott on it. There we go, we can see that easily. And you should be able to, like the word Westcott should be kind of blurry. And it is. And when I take that shot and I look at it, the word Westcott is kind of blurry because it's, it's not that far behind her, but it's far enough behind her to be out of the, or in the depth of field. Uh, so if I go back to the camera settings, and I crank that aperture all the way to as high as this lens will go, f22, watch what happens. I'm, I'm going to press the shutter and it's not gonna be instant. See how the camera went dark? And it's about eight seconds before we'll actually see the image. Because what aperture priority is doing is it saying, I'm going to let you set the aperture to whatever you want? So in this case, F22, a very closed aperture, therefore not a lot of light coming in. So I need eight seconds of exposure, eight seconds of light to properly expose this photo. That's what aperture priority does for me. So when I'm out and about walking around, I'm just choosing my f-stop and the camera is taking care of the shutter speed for me. And therefore, I'm always usually going to get a properly exposed photo, but I was in control of the aperture. That makes sense? That's why it's called aperture mode or aperture priority. It's because you're prioritizing the aperture over anything else. Okay, next up. What? Well, Eight seconds is fine for a mannequin because <laughs> she's not moving. Try and get a kid to stand still this long without making it a game. And even if you make it a game, they're not going to stand still that long. Even if they move a little, now you got a blurry picture. So, and if you're hand holding, forget it. You can't hand hold your camera. I don't care who you are. You can't hand hold your camera steady for eight seconds. Okay, I know, but she never smiles. So if I really wanted to shoot at F22 so everything's in focus and I can't wait eight seconds because the subject might move, then there's only one other choice. I gotta have light. Or I got to have the camera move to a higher ISO. What's ISO? I, just, I, I had to look up the acronym because I'd forgotten. Someone says it stands for International Standards Organization. Who cares? What is ISO? <laughs> ISO is what we used to refer to, for those of you old enough to go into film days, it's your film grain. So... If you wanted pictures to not look grainy, 
you would buy a, a, a 200 ISO or 200 film grain for your film. If you didn't care, you're shooting at night, you might go 1600. Same thing applies on your digital camera. So if I press down the ISO button and I crank the ISO up, let's go 800. Now I take the same shot. Ready? One, two, three. That was three seconds. But what I ended up with on the computer is an image that's going to have more grain in it. It's going to have more noise in the image. Now, most professional cameras, most, I shouldn't say professional, most newer cameras, 800 is not that bad. 800 used to make, like, that used to be my bare, like, that was my ceiling. I didn't want to go any higher than 800 because it would just, the image would be so noisy, it wouldn't be usable. So, let's try it again. Let's go ISO. Let's go 1600. Ready? One. Let's go back to the settings. One, two, three. Still, that click, click is not instant. So you still run a risk of the image coming out blurry. All right, let's go higher. That's faster. Let's go even higher. Now I'm at ISO 6400. Now we're getting to more of an instant shot. Let's go even higher. ISO 10,000. All right, now we're at the point of the, a regular shutter speed. That's one eighth of a second. Let's even go higher. And I'm looking at the shutter speed in the lower left corner. When I get to about one sixtieth of a second, which is the high, I'm on high ISO now. Remember when I said you can't possibly hand hold your, your, your camera at eight seconds and get a, get a shot that's not blurry? The human hand, arm, whatever, needs the shutter speed to be at least one sixtieth of a second to get a not blurry shot. Unless you're really still and you're really braced against the wall or something, you need at least one sixtieth of a second. Uh, for me, I need one eightieth of a second because it, it, I, I just will still get a blurry shot even at one sixtieth. Okay, so let's say that I don't want my ISO to be so noisy. This is what you would get, by the way, with that highest ISO. Look at all that grain. This is what you would get. And I had someone come up to me recently and say, my pictures are always grainy. And I, the, my first response is, well, what ISO are you using? That's what's going to get you grainy shots. So now, how can I not have that grain? Let's put the ISO back down to a reasonable number. Let's go all the way back down to, let's go back down to 600. 800, I mean. That's the highest I would normally go. I, I go higher than that sometimes now, but that's the highest I would normally go. So I'm back down 800. Okay. Like a pick made of sand, exactly. Uh, so let's say that I, I, I need at least one sixtieth of a second if I'm hand holding or if I want my subject is likely to move. I, I don't want to go any higher than ISO 800. Then the only other choice is, if you're not gonna light your subject, you gotta come down on that aperture. You gotta go from F22 down to something more reasonable. So as I bring down the F-stop, and even then, even all the way down to F2.8, my camera is telling me the best I'll get with this lighting is one fortieth of a second. But at least that picture will not be grainy. It might be out of focus if you're hand holding, but it won't be grainy. Now, split the difference. Let's say that I want to go to 
Uh, someone said that's an expensive lens. So let's go to a more reasonable setting. Let's go to f4.5, which pretty much every lens can do. All right, and I want to get it up to f. I want to get up to one sixtieth of a second. Then I need to shoot in this lighting at ISO 3200. So here we are. I'm at f4.5, which is still reasonable. Still going to have a little shallow depth of field. I'm at ISO 3200 on newer cameras, which isn't horrible. And I'm at, I'm still getting, now I'm going to get 160 of a second, so I could technically handhold it. And if I look at that shot, there's a little bit more grain than ISO 800, but it's still much better. Okay, so what have we learned? We learned the exposure triangle. That's what it's referred to. That's what most people call it. The exposure triangle is ISO or aperture, shutter speed, ISO. Not necessarily in that order, but that's, those are the three elements that make up the triangle. So what that means is you're, you're always controlling, you're always giving and taking between those three things. So, if you're not in control of adding more light, then you got to bump up the ISO. If you want a more shallow depth of field, you got to shoot more wide open. If you want to freeze motion, you got to shoot at a higher shutter speed. So all of those things relate to each other. And that's, if you learn nothing else today, that's what it is at the end of the day. So what's the difference between aperture priority and the letter S for shutter priority? Remember aperture priority, I got to choose what my f-stop is and it automatically figured out the shutter speed based on ISO and the light. Shutter priority is the other piece of the triangle that you're, you're prioritizing. You're saying, I want to set my shutter speed, and I don't care what the aperture is, and just make a, make a good exposure based on this shutter speed. When would I ever shoot in shutter priority? When I'm shooting something that's moving. Race cars, horses, planes, anything that's moving quickly for sports, anything that's moving quickly, and you want to freeze it. So it's not blurry when you look at the shot. So let me switch back to the computer for a second. Let's get out of that. Let's go over to Lightroom, cloud version. And I'm going to tell you a story uh, with pictures. So let's, uh, where's my pointer there? There we go. So this beautiful horse here was actually, I photographed this horse in Iceland. And I wasn't expecting to photograph horses that day. Our friend Einar was leading my tour and he took me over to this horse farm, unannounced. And he said, oh, we got these beautiful horses to photograph and great, have fun. And so I'm used to things not moving. <laughs> so click, beautiful picture of a horse standing still. However, I was out of my element when she started making the horses run because I couldn't remember fast enough what to put my camera setting on to freeze the motion. I just, I, my, I had a mental block. I knew what it was after it was over. Like when it's too late, I was like, oh, you stupid idiot. You should have put it on this, that, and the other. But in that moment of having never really focused on anything moving and then being thrown into that situation, I would have been better off on auto, probably, or something else, because I was still shooting in aperture priority. I was still shooting in manual, maybe, but I wasn't shooting in shutter priority. So every single one of my shots, now this doesn't look bad, but when you zoom in on it, hang on, let's see if I can zoom in more. It's out of focus. Every single one, not a one, was in focus because every single one had the wrong shutter speed and therefore every single one was slightly out of focus. And I was extremely disappointed in myself 
because I didn't have my camera on the right settings. So again, it doesn't look too bad until you zoom in and you see that it's really out of focus because wrong camera setting. All right, so what should I have been on? This one doesn't look too bad. Oh my God, you got a winner. You got one in here you can use, yay. Do I? Not really, it's not sharp enough. It's, it's probably one of the better ones, but it's not right. So in this case, I, I screwed this up. I screwed this up big time. And I'm showing you my failure so you don't make the same mistake. As a matter of fact, the horse was so disappointed in me, it just walked away. It's just like, oh, you, you don't know what you're doing. I'm just going to, I'm out here running. I'm giving you my best stuff and you're wasting my time because all your pictures of me are blurry. So just turn and walked away. Okay. <laughs> so um, next time around, I need to shoot something moving. I did my research first and I knew what settings going into it that I needed to keep things in focus that are moving and nothing moves faster than the Blue Angels. Oh, sorry. Someone said, can we see the horses? I'm like, yeah, you should be seeing them. Let me go back. All right, let's, let's do that again. Beautiful horse. That was a shot. Then I talked about it started moving. And then I did this to show you. Sorry, I, it wasn't on the right, right scene for you to see that. But anyway, um, this is what I meant by out of focus. There we go. That, that's what I was showing you earlier. Now I'm looking right at the screen. I didn't see it. I wasn't showing you that. So there we go. That's what I mean by, yeah, they weren't going that fast. I was just bad. So my failure and, hang on, let me, Go by, let me show you the one that I thought was kind of okay. That one looks kind of okay, right? Doesn't look too bad until you zoom in. And it's just enough to be out of focus to where I never used it because it's just not right. I wasn't on the right settings. All right, so anyway, and then I made the joke that they got so disappointed in me, they just started all walking away. They're like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. We're leaving. He's just not good. Okay, anyway, next time out, I was better prepared. I found out the day before that there was gonna be an air show near me. And I was like, do I really wanna go shoot an air show? I've never shot an air show. I've never shot anything fast action, never shot anything moving before. But what a better way to learn. There's no pressure. Either I get shots or I don't. Like no one's, no, no one even knows I'm going. So nothing to lose. So I paid the money online, bought the ticket, went the next day, took my gear. Uh, do I have it down there somewhere? I, ha I have like a Tamron uh, 150 to 600 millimeter lens. And I did all my research and I said, I'm going to get good shots from this air show or I'm going to learn one way or the other the hard way. Now, here's the thing about an air show. Don't be afraid that you're not get, that every shot's not good. You have a jet flying by at hundreds of miles an hour. And you don't, you don't necessarily, unless you've been to the air show a million times, you don't know which way they're even coming from. So, oh my God, here comes a jet. And you're like, you have it on uh, fast shutter and you're just shooting as many as you can. And hopefully, hoping that out of those 50 shots you just took, one is good. So that's the way an air show works. They're not always going to be good. No, if anyone tells you that, they're probably lying. So anyway, I got quality. I got images that I can actually use. I froze action like a like a like a beast. I was I was on it. So anyway, um, here's another thing I learned, and these are in my portfolio. If you go to TerryWhite.photography, you can see these. But what another thing I learned is that proper shutter speed isn't the same for every single aerial act. Blue Angels, I was shooting at one thousandth of a second, which pretty much any camera will do, any you know, regular camera will do. But propeller planes, prop planes, 
I shot at one two fiftieth of a second, much slower. Not because they're going that much slower, because what you want when you're shooting a prop plane is you want the propeller to look like it's spinning. If I would have shot this plane at one thousandth of a second, it would be frozen, it would be crystal clear, and the propeller would look like it's like not spinning. It would just look like it's, it caught, got caught in whatever position it was in when I took the shot. So you'd be like, how's that plane in the air? Like the, propel the engine's off. The propellers aren't moving because that's what freezing action does. So when you're shooting prop planes, you actually want to not freeze it completely because you want the propeller to look like it's still turning. And if I go out of that shot, same thing here. You want that, you want that motion blur. And you'll only get this with practice. I spent hours that day shooting my first live action thing, getting hours of practice. So I got really, you know, I got really decent shots out of it because I know, number one, I went in knowing the mistakes I've made in the past and doing a little research up front to what my settings should be. And I got some fantastic moments. All right, so shutter priority, which isn't gonna do me much good here in the studio because nothing's moving. But what shutter priority says, I'll just put, push, push my tripod down, I guess it wasn't tight. No, it's not tight. What shutter priority says is, I'm going to let you choose the shutter speed and I'll set the aperture based on that shutter speed. So if I increase my shutter speed, it's dropping my aperture down to f2.8 because it's saying if you want to shoot at 1 1/1600th one of a second, I need your most wide open aperture. If I go down on the shutter speed, notice my f-stop going up. So now we're at, let's say we shoot at one, one tenth of a second. So that's f14. So we already know the shutter is gonna be open for a few seconds, but I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna go ahead and press the shutter button. Oh, it wasn't actually that bad, hang on. Let me freeze it a little bit more. All right, yeah, I want something like that. So that's a half a second. Actually, let's do one second. One second. Okay, here we go. So the shutter's gonna stay open for one second. Ready? So, let's see what I got. Okay, not enough. Show you what I'm looking at. I'm moving my hand in front of the lens, in front of her, which should create a blur. I went a little crazy. I'm shooting at 1 20th of a second. So give it a second. And it's too, <laughs> no, it's too bright. All right, so it basically said, oh, well, if you're gonna do that, I can make the image super bright. I should have known that. So let's see what that looks like. Okay. All right, there we go. That's the shot I'm looking for. So see how she's still perfectly fine because she's not moving, but you can't tell. I mean, you can probably guess it's my hand, but you can't really see my hand because at 1.3 seconds, it's too, it's not fast enough to capture my hand and freeze it. There we go. So you're controlling the shutter speed, therefore you're controlling what's frozen and what's not based on the subject. 
and shutter priority. So anything moving, you should immediately think shutter priority because that way you can set the shutter speed one one thousandth of a second for plane or for a jet flying by, one two fiftieth of a second for prop planes. So you can freeze the prop or you know, have the prop, props have submersion blur like my hand, so forth and so on. All right, it's a bird. Next up, manual. And then we're, we're out of time in five more minutes. Okay, so manual. Manual says, you got it. You're in control. Change the aperture, change the ISO, change the shutter speed to whatever you want. So my typical studio setup would be, I would start around F5.6. I would normally do one, one twenty uh, shutter speed, or one, one, one twenty-fifth of a second. And my ISO, I want down to 100. I want the best possible quality with no grain. Now, here's the problem. If I take this manual shot, so in other words, the camera's not doing anything for me. Saying, you know your settings, you set it to whatever you want, I'm just gonna give you what you asked for. So this is what I asked for. And by the way, let me show you the settings. So we're on M for manual, 1 1 25th of a second, F5.6 is which I, what I would normally do in studio. So if I leave it on those settings, normally in studio, and I take that shot, that's what I'm going to get. Because in studio, I'm normally lighting my subject. And therefore, I can, yep, someone said, this is going to be dark. Because at 1 1 25th of a second, I don't have to worry about anything really moving too much. At f5.6, I got a good amount of depth of field, and usually I'm shooting on a white background or a plain color background, doesn't matter. And at ISO 100, I'm getting no grain. But that means I gotta light it, so let's light it. All right, and before I light it, let's say that I didn't have a light. What can I do, what can I change to get this to light up? I can change my ISO. So I can bump my ISO to let's say 640. Gets a little better, but see, now I'm gonna have to give and take. I'm gonna have to keep, I can bump my uh, F-stop down to 2.8. That should be brighter, but still not bright enough. And I'm not willing to go higher on the ISO to make it brighter, because then I'm gonna get the green. So you're just always making these choices. So let's go back down to ISO 100. Let's go back up to F5.6. And we're gonna keep it at 125th. We're gonna put the uh, trigger for the uh, light on and we're going to turn the strobe on. There we go. And we're going to go in and turn the trigger on. And I, I'll have to play because I'm not using a light meter to see what the light's going to look like. But I'm back down to my regular settings, which you can see right here. Manual, F5.6, 1 25th of a second. Mainly, most importantly, ISO 100, so it still looks good. And if I were to shoot that, take that shot, we saw a flash. And then we go in and we look at it and you start getting that light separation. The subject's lit from this soft box, the background's kind of not lit because there's no lights on back there. And this is what portrait photography is all about. Deciding what, or pretty much any subject photography is deciding what's gonna be lit, what's not. So again, if I now want it brighter, I turn the light up or move it closer. So let's crank the power of the light up a little bit more. And let's take that shot. And it got brighter. Okay, so that is it in a nutshell, folks. Now I, I promised you smartphone, so let me go to that real quick. All right. Uh, 
I lose my smartphone? Oh, hang on, hold on, hold on. We got like less than a minute left. Oh, we're not going to do this thing. Huh? And there are the dogs. Someone's at the front door. Oh, just when I had it working earlier. Well, anyway, what I was going to show you is that if you want to have the same controls that you have uh, on a regular camera in your smartphone, then if you're not already using Lightroom on your smartphone, download the Lightroom app and use that. Because the Lightroom app lets you shoot with manual settings. So I'm, not, I'm gonna get cut off if I keep going. So anyway, Lightroom app, manual settings, that's the way to go. And I hope you got something out of this. The exposure triangle, shooting in all the different modes, learning more of your, about your settings beyond those modes, and then going from there. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one.